Hello, I'm Rafał. I came from Poland. I'm super happy to be here. To be honest, I expected a little warmer temperature in California. You know, like when you look on the TV, there's always, California is always sunny and hot. So I didn't bring too much warm clothes. You know, when I was leaving Poland, it was actually warmer. So yeah, <laughs> consider going to Poland. Uh, today I'll talk about uh, caching, especially about caching in the microservice world. But I've, first, a few words about myself. I'm a cloud software engineer at Hazelcast. Uh, I do talking from time to time, but I'm not only talker, so forgive me any mistakes or anything. Uh, I used to work at CERN, at, CERN at, at Google before. I'm also an author of the book, which is called Continuous Delivery with Docker and Jenkins. And I, as I said, I live in Poland and Krakow. It's a very nice city, so I can really recommend visiting this. If you consider going to Europe, don't, choose, don't be like everyone, don't choose Paris, go to Krakow. A few words about Hazelcast. So Hazelcast is a distributed company. Is it distributed in two meanings? Uh, first, it's distributed because we produce distributed software, but it's also distributed because, like, all our engineering team is, all our engineering team is like remote. Everybody works from a different place. We have a few guys in the U.S., but we, I'm from Poland. There are guys from Czechia. There are guys, there are a few people from Turkey, so we are all, all over the world. Our, we have three products. Uh, first is the uh, most known, Hazelcast IMDG. Who of you have heard about Hazelcast IMDG? Okay, so Hazelcast IMDG, uh, so about ha half of you. So Hazelcast IMDG is, um, is like, um, we call it cache on steroids. It's actually a data store for anything, but a lot of companies using this for caching. Hazelcast Jet is a library for stream processing, and Hazelcast Cloud is a, Hazelcast as a service, so a cloud version of, of Hazelcast. The agenda for our talk is very simple, so there will be a very short introduction about caching in general, and then we will walk through all possible patterns, all possible topologies that you can use in your system. Um, when I speak, you can think about, I would like you to think about two things. One is like, which of the topologies you use in your system, because probably you use some caching, and you must use one of them because this list is complete. And the second qu question I, I have for you is like, what, which can I change, does it, make change, does it make sense to change to any other for me? So let's start. So why do we do caching? So, Caching, we do it for two reasons. First is the most obvious, so it's to decrease the latency uh, for the performance. So you don't want to do some long-lasting computation uh, more than one time, so you do it once, then you cache it, and that's it. Then you take it from the cache. The second one is a little less obvious. We, we do it for a resilience. So you can think about it like uh, some in some cases, even if your service is down, you can still return a cached value. Let's take, as an example, let's take Amazon recommendation service. So you can see, you can buy something on Amazon, you have the recommendation. It can be, it, it doesn't have to be fresh all the time. You may still think it works, but it, the service may be down. So this is another, another uh, reason for using caching. How does it look like in a microservice world? So this, is a, this diagram is a classic microservice architecture. So we have a lot of services written in different programming languages. They have versions. They use each other. Uh, so a complex architecture. So where is the right place, place to put your uh, cache? Is it like an inside of this service or maybe as a separate cache server or maybe in front of each service. And that is what this talk is about. So let's start from the first and simplest pattern, first and simplest topology, which is embedded cache. So the simplest thing we can do is to put cache 
inside our application service. So the flow looks as follows. Request goes to our system, it goes to the load balancer, the load balancer forwards into one of, one of the application services, then the application service uh, checks if in, in the internal cache if such request were, was already executed, if yes, return the cache value, if not, do some long lasting business operation and then put it into cache. This long lasting business computation can be anything. Some of you may think of the caching about like the, about the database, cache to the database, but it can be actually anything. It can be just some, some computation, it can be, um, it can be like a call to external service, just whatever that takes time. This is so simple that if you would like, you can write it, the code on your own, don't use any library. So that would be the simplest code uh, you can imagine if you happen to use Java. So uh, the simplest code you can imagine, like the request goes to the, the method, then it checks if the cache contains it, they have returned the, returned the cached value. If no, do some processing, put it into cache and return the response. So you can write it like using standard libraries. That would be for Java, but for any programming language you have some collections so you, you could use it. But better don't do it. Because like uh, there are a few problems with, uh, with such uh, approach. So it has no eviction policies, it has no max size limit, no statistic, no built-in cache loaders, no expiration time and no notification mechanism. So basically Java collection or any collection is not a cache. So much better is to use some library for Java, a very good library for embedded cache is, a, is Guava. Another one where, where, where you can construct your object and you can specify all these parameters up front. Another very good example is eh cache. If you don't use Java just for any programming language, you have a simple library to, for, for caching. We can even take the caching one level higher and don't program so level, you know, check if it's in the cache, but put it in the application level in the framework. For Java, it will be probably a Spring. So in Spring, uh, that is the code that will uh, that will first check if if the before calling the um, find book uh, in the slow source method, it will first check if the given ISBN is in the cache. And off only if it's not found, then it will call this find book and slow source method. So you can do it this way, but be careful with the Spring because for some reason Spring uses concurrent hash map by default. So it's, you are better off specifying your own cache manager. It can be, for example, uh, as I mentioned, Spring or EHCache. So we are done with the simplest possible caching pattern. But one problem is about this is, imagine that a request goes to the load balancer and first it goes to the application on the top. We do some long lasting computation, put it into cache or fine. Then the same request goes, however load balancer forwards it to the application on the bottom. So we have to do the computation again because these caches are completely separate. So one improvement to the embedded cache would be embedded distributed cache. It's the same pattern in terms of the architecture because cache is still inside your application. However, this time we use a different library. We'll use Hazelcast. Obviously, I'm from Hazelcast, but that's not only the only reason why I show it here. Actually, if you use Java and you would like to have this embedded distributed caching, this is the, the best solution. Um, so Hazelcast is the library, so we don't have to change anything. Uh, it will, and, and it will automatically form a cluster from the embedded caches. So to whatever cache cache instance you put, it will be one consistent cluster. And it's just a library, so in case of Spring, all we have to change is to define 
Hazelcast as a cash manager. And then all, in all parts of the Spring application, Hazelcast will be used as a caching provider. A quick demo on that. So if you are like an old guy like me and like Java, this will probably how, how will your uh, service will look like. And if we define like the Hazelcast as a cache manager and start two instances of the same service, uh, we have to wait because it's, it's Java, so everything is, you know, Java and startup time. Uh, but in a moment, we should see that uh, it cre this created like the first uh, member in the cluster. This is our cluster. And this is the, the second one should join, so they join together, and they're from one consistent cache cluster. Now you may wonder, like, how is possible that they discover themselves they discovered themselves automatically? So in a case when run locally, they use multicast. However, for each environment, we provide a plugin, like discovery plugin, which says, "How should I discover my the other node of the cluster?" So we created like a layer of, um, of a plugins, which, which you can even write your own plugin. All these plugins are, uh, this actually, all these plugins are maintained by, by us, but there are a couple more uh, maintained by the community. Uh, and they use the API of the given environment to discover other, other members. For example, in Kubernetes, we query the Kubernetes API to check members. You can filter them and, like this, form one Kubernetes cluster. This is very good because um, you write once your application and then you can just change the plugin and deploy it in a different environment and you are sure that they will form one cache cluster. If you are interested in details, we publish a lot of blog posts on how to configure this uh, and, and with Kubernetes or with Eureka. Uh, actually, if you, if you don't find your plugin for your environment, then you can always use Eureka. You can either write your own uh, or, or use Eureka as a service registry, which, we, which Hazelcast will use for the discovery. So we ended up with, uh, with a picture like this. So let's look at the pros and cons of the embedded caching solution. So from the, from the good sides, it's very simple. The configuration deployment is very simple because you deploy it together with your service. Data the, is very, the latency is very low because you cannot actually do anything better than have it in the same process, your data. So you will not make better latency than embedded cache. And you don't need any ops team or DevOps effort to maintain anything because it goes together with your application. From the downsides, the management is not flexible. So if you would like to scale up, like your, you need bigger cache because you have some peak, load peak, you have you get bigger cache, you have to scale it up together with your application. So you cannot scale it separately. The solution I, I've show, uh, I presented were limited to JVM based because I used Hazelcast as embedded. For other uh, programming languages, you probably use, uh, find some other, other caching solutions. And another downside is that data is collocated with the application, which may not seem like a problem, but if you work in a big enterprise, usually is a problem that for like security that your data you keep are in the same place where your application. So we covered like, the first pattern. Second one will be client server. So client server is like a database. It's like a database because you have it, you start server separately. And it works like this. Again, a request goes to load balancer, it loads balances the traffic to one of the application, and then the application uses cache client to connect to cache server to check if the value is in the cache. And I said it's like a database style, and like if we compare it to the P 
picture from a moment ago, like the embedded cache, there are two main differences. First one is obvious. We have this on the diagram. So this need to, needs to be separately managed, uh, which has, is good and bad. Good thing is that we can scale up, down separately. Uh, the bad thing is that we have to uh, take care of this. We have to have people, hire people, or we need to spend some time on managing the cache server. That is, but I mentioned there are two differences. So this was the one one, but the second one is now we use a cache client library, which may not sound like a big thing. However, uh, now you are not limited to Java because you can run cache client in any programming language you want and still use Hazelcast. Because now we be between cl client and server, we have a well-defined protocol. So there are a lot of clients. You can even write your own client for some other languages. Um, and such a strategy that we have a server and, and clients in different, and application with, in different programming languages, it's actually very consistent with the microservice world when we usually set up a server and you can use it from any programming language you want. It's so common that um, if you, you look for some alternatives to Hazelcast, like Redis or Memcache, uh, then you will see that they use only client-server mode. So, for example, Redis is, I guess, written in C, so you cannot really embed it. So you can only use it in client-server uh, client mode. So how to start a server, Hazelcast server? So we, if you are uh, using, like, normal environment, there is just a script, you start it, members discover themselves, and then you use client to discover the server. If you happen to use Kubernetes, uh, we have a Helm chart. Helm chart is a package manager for Kubernetes applications. So with this one command, you can deploy the whole cache server on, uh, on, on Kubernetes. How the client will look like, we specify that please use Kubernetes client with this get Kubernetes config set enable true. And that's all, the cluster at our server will be detected automatically. So you see there is no static configuration here. It's everything is based on this uh, discovery plugins, which I presented before. Let's go back to the diagram from a moment before. And uh, so we moved our cache outside our application and it needs to be managed by a separate team. So we can move it even more outside and move it into the cloud. So cloud is like a client server. The idea, the pattern is the same. However, um, it's very specific because the, our server part is managed by someone else. So we don't have to worry about all this stuff that we were worried in client server with on-premise on, on solution. We, we just have to uh, pay for, for this. <laughs> um, yes, so a quick demo on, uh, before demo I will show you the, the, this, the, uh, the, how the code looks like. Uh, so you specify some, and like actually in all, um, any application in the cloud, if you use, I don't know, Elastic Cloud or everything, it works the same. You have some discovery token and the name of the cluster and password, and it will automatically find your, where is your uh, server part and connect to this. A quick demo on uh, how to set up like a Hazelcast cloud server on, in, in Hazelcast cloud. So if you go to the, our website, cloudhazelcast.com, you will see a web console like with in any other uh, any other cloud application, if you click on new cluster, you specify the cluster name, then you specify the, uh, then you specify the underlying provider, specify the size, and click create, it will create the cluster. This specifying the prov underlying provider is very important and I will, I will um, tell you in a moment why. In the meantime, let's see, like the cluster should be created in a, in a, in a second. 
uh, and you click on configure client, you can even download the whole code for the client to connect. Uh, but for our example, we will just need the dis discovery token and the password. So we copy the discovery token into our application. And also the password. And if we start this application, so it's still the same application, that is a good thing. So we only change the cache manager configuration. And now, instead of using this embedded cache, which you've seen on the previous demo, it will connect to the, uh, to the Hazelcast as a service, Hazelcast in the cloud. Again, Spring, we have to wait for this. Uh, but in a moment, we, you should see our application connected to, connected to the uh, cache server. So we created like a one member cluster and this is it. Uh, one member cluster, you can create it for free actually. So it's like a free, like on AWS, you have this free possibility of creating free instances. So the same uh, here. So pros and cons of client server and cloud cache. So from the good sides, data is separated from the application which is a must for a lot of companies. We have a separate management, so we can scale up, scale down, uh, backups, anything uh, separately. It's programming language agnostic because we use uh, the client and the well-defined protocol. From the downsides, if you use on-premise, you obviously have to maintain your server. If you use cloud, you have to pay for this. It has a higher latency, and this is, yeah, this is what, what I started to, to tell in this demo. Uh, you remember in the demo we selected cluster name, but also we selected underlying cloud provider. We selected the AWS in this demo. And that's very important because if you, if your deployment, if you, you deploy your application in, on AWS, you would like your cache server to also be on AWS because otherwise it would be very slow. You would like to have it on AWS in the same region as your application. Because otherwise, this, the latency will suffer. And it is very important because we are in the, in the domain of in-memory computing, like the whole conference. So in-memory in, in data, the specific, like the reason why you use in-memory data is because of the performance. So you cannot keep your server in a different region, you cannot keep your server in Poland and connect it from US. So it's important, the same region, the same underlying cloud provider as your application, but even more actually. So what we, what we do is uh, when you deploy your uh, on-premise server, you have to be sure that it's in the same network because even like one network, one root router hop is, uh, is a lot. When you deploy it on our cloud, we provide a way to do a VPC peering so that your, your application network and your uh, cache server network, they are the same virtual network on AWS. That you don't have even this network hop in between where connecting in the, to the server. And that's very important. We, we thought, thought about it a lot because like, again, we are in the low latency domain. So you cannot say, Okay, we, we will you know, jump a lot of router hop and then slow it down. So you have to think about it like, in both in cloud and the client server, think where uh, about networking. Okay, we covered like the, mo the most popular solutions because like you may say like, like that client server embedded is nothing new and it's true. So this one it will be something completely new in the, in the development world, a sidecar. So sidecar is, um, this will be limited to Kubernetes because sidecar pattern is generally limited to container-based environment. So maybe let's start from in Kubernetes, a few words about Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, a deployment unit is called a pod. And this pod can contain one or more containers. Containers is uh, your application, basically. 
Usually it contains one application, like your web service. However, in some cases you may want to have additional container with some additional feature. For example, you would like to have a logging agent which would, would redirect your logs to some, to the cloud, to, um, I don't know, to Elastic Cloud, for example. Or, so this additional container is called sidecar container. So it does not have a business logic, but some provides, it provides some additional functionality. You can think of it as aspect-oriented programming. Now, one pod, all containers in one pod in Kubernetes are guaranteed to be deployed on the same physical machine. So now, uh, with this introduction, we go to, to this diagram, so how we can use cache as a sidecar. So again, starting from the request, the request goes to Kubernetes service, which is kind of a load balancer in the Kubernetes world. Then it goes to one of the Kubernetes pod. Inside the pod, it goes to the application container, which is our application. Then application container uses cache client to connect to the cache server. But this cache server is always located inside the same pod. So it's always located on the local host, the same machine. And all the sidecars, they form a cluster. So if you think about it, it's something in between embedded mode and client-server mode. It is, um, it is em more embedded because we, uh, it's still the same, we, the cache is on the same physical machine as the application, and it uses the same resource pool. It also scales up and down together with the application. However, it's also similar to client-server because um, after all, we use this cache client, so it can be any programming language, uh, and there is some separation between, uh, of the data between, um, uh, there's on, the separation is on the container level between the application and the data. How would, we, how would the code look, lo look like for, for this solution? So again, in the Spring Cache Manager, we, we create a static configuration, always connect to the local host, because we know that our cache server is on the, on the local host. So the configuration is static, but all the system is, is dynamic, actually. Kubernetes configuration will look like this. So we have, uh, we will have in one pod specific, in deployment, like the pod specification and this pod specification, two containers. The one at the bottom, this Hazelcast, Hazelcast will be always the same. It's our cache server and application. This is our business logic, so it will be always different for different, uh, for different systems. Pros and cons. So again, we have simple configuration but it's programming language agnostic. Again, we have load latency, and there is some isolation on container level of data and application. From the downside, it's limited to the container-based environments. The management, management is not flexible again, and the data is technically collocated in the same application pod, which can be a problem or not, depending on your uh, requirements. With this pattern, we will move to the last one, which is reverse proxy caching. So the last pattern will be something completely new. It will be completely different than the other one. So, so far, with all these patterns, application was aware that something like cache exists. So application was aware of the caching. Now we will do it differently. We will put the caching in front of our application. So the application is not even connected to the cache. This time the float is as follows. So a request goes to our uh, system, it goes to the load balancer, and just after the load balancer or before load balancer, we have a caching layer. And only if a request is not found in a, in a, in a cache, only then it's forwarded to the application. So a very good and major solution is Nginx. So actually, you can even configure this together with your load balancer. Uh, the, to, the configuration for Nginx 
it's obviously the caching now is on the on the protocol level, most most probably on the HTTP level. If you would like to use Nginx, which is a very good solution, then all you have to do is specify the simplest configuration is uh, is this one. So specify the path where uh, cache should be stored. However, Nginx is, uh, is, is a very good solution. It has some, uh, some downsides. So it, it is only based on HTTP, but I think it's not a big problem in the current world when all services are based basically on HTTP. However, it's not distributed, it's not highly available, and data is stored on disk. In fact, data is not stored on disk, it's just offloads on the disk. Because I, I told on what one meetup the data is stored on the disk, and someone said, but the data is not stored on the disk. It's true. However, if you use, for, for example, Hazelcast, you are guaranteed that nothing is stored on the disk. So we are guaranteed about the performance. Here, your data can be offloaded to the, to the, to the disk space. You, um, you can, like, you can fight this pro these problems of Nginx by uh, using some modules. Um, but however, like the module like for Redis is very immature. For Hazelcast, it doesn't exist yet, so there is still some time. Um, so either you can contribute to making these modules better or, or someone has to, uh, has to invest some time on that. Currently, I, I would not recommend any of them like uh, for using in, in production. But we can think of like taking this reverse proxy idea one level higher and connect it to the with the sidecar idea and to have like our final final uh, pattern for today. So to have reverse proxy sidecar. Again, we will be limited to the uh, to the Kubernetes environment. So this time, it, the flow will, will look as follows. Request goes to the, our Kubernetes service. It is load balanced to one of the Kubernetes pod. However, this time, it's not the application that receives the request, but the reverse proxy uh, cache container. So we create a special container which will in, kind of intercept our request and first first check if it's in the cache, and only if it's not found, then redirect uh, it to the application. So such approach with this reverse proxy and like application not knowing about cache, uh, it has some good and bad sides. Yeah? But let's be optimistic and start from the good side. So you may remember the diagram from the beginning. Of, our, of this presentation. So we have a classic microservice system. A lot of services, different versions, different programming languages, they use each other. So um, kind of a mess in the terms of, we, this is a very small system, but normally it's, it's very, you have a lot of microservices. So now the good thing about this uh, reverse proxy is that you can look at the architecture and say, I would like to have cache in this and this service. And you can do it like in a, on the configuration level, in a declarative manner, not touching the, any code of the, of the services themselves. So this is very good when you think about it. So you kind of inject caching into your system. And that is like the whole beauty of this reverse proxy, that you don't even touch the code, you don't have to think about it to improve the performance. In a Kubernetes configuration, this would look like this. So we have, starting from the bottom, we have this our application, so this will be always different. Then we have another container, which is uh, this caching proxy container. And we, we need one more, which is, um, init container is a con it's some container, some code that is run before anything starts. So we need to do a small trick to our uh, Kubernetes pod. This will be the trick. So normally the requests on some pod will be always received by the application because it's the application that, that uh, exposes this port. However, we have to tweak the networking inside so that each external call to our system will be um, 
it will be uh, will be will be accepted by the uh, cache container, not the application container, and all the internal calls will be forwarded to the application. And this magic, this init container, all that is all the code actually. So we change the IP tables for, uh, and uh, change change the routing. So when you look at this diagram again, it may make you think about uh, service mesh and Istio. That is that is actually the diagram from the Istio uh, documentation. So it's very similar. So what Istio does is um, they, in a declarative manner, they let you forward the traffic saying that I would like from one service 10% of my traffic to go to the service version one and 90% to service version two. So you can control the traffic in your system and it's, it's also in a declarative manner. So you don't have to touch your services to say how the traffic should go. They also have a feature for security. Um, so it's again like the, the whole idea of aspect-oriented programming that you don't touch the code to add some functionality. And actually, because Istio is getting super popular, it's you can already you, you can deploy it like with clicking on a console like in Google Cloud Platform already. And they plan to introduce caching, so they have an open um, open GitHub issue. Um, when you look at this issue, it may you know 2017. It doesn't look promising, but uh, they are working actively on that. So, so they they are uh, they they have. They have open PRs on the GitHub with this implementation, so it's close to getting uh, getting done. And when Istio implements this idea of reverse proxy caching, it will get very popular. But I told you that this idea that application does not even know about caching, it also has some bad sides. So there is one thing that becomes way more difficult for caching, and that is cache invalidation. If you look anywhere on the internet, what causes most issues with caching, everyone will tell you the same, it's invalidation, meaning when to decide that your cached value is no longer valid, that it's stale, that I should not use it. So when, it, so normally like uh, when the application is aware of the, of the uh, cache, you can tell the application can decide, the business logic can decide, like in a spring you have annotation for this. So if something happened, call this method and this method will invalidate some entry in the cache. But if the application does not know about the cache, then you are limited to some, some protocol level things, so, so like HTTP based, like timeouts, e-tags, like basically timeouts. So you have to do the timeout. So this may be good enough for you, but it's, uh, you probably already see that it's limited to some, uh, some scenarios. Quick pros and cons of the solution. So the biggest benefit of this is configuration based. It's, you do it in a declarative manner. Obviously it's programming language agnostic. It's everything agnostic, you don't even touch the code. And it's very consistent with the containers and microservice world. So I think when the Istio implements it, it's very, that will be the, the future of, of, uh, of caching. From the downsides, you have these uh, problems with invalidation. There is no major solution for uh, reverse proxy sidecar. We did in Hazelcast a prototype on that, but it's nothing that you can use in production. Uh, Istio is implementing this, but it will take some time when it gets mature. And the last downside is protocol based, which probably is not a problem in current world. Everybody is programming HTTP based things. So with this, we, we cover all the patterns. So as a very short summary, I will uh, not repeat anything I said before. But since we had like there are a lot of patterns, so I propose like a very short decision tree which can help you decide which pattern to use. It's very sim it's oversimplified, but it may give you the direction. So the first question I would ask is, 
does my application need to be aware of the cache? And if no, then is my uh, environment container-based? If no, then use reverse proxy. If yes, then use reverse proxy sidecar as soon as it's there is some major solution available. If my application needs to be aware of the, of the cache, then next question is, do I have a lot of data or do I have some security restrictions? If no, then is my application language agnostic? Uh, does my cache need to be language agnostic or it's container based? If no, use embedded, distributed. If yes, use sidecar. If you have a lot of data or you have security restrictions, then you have the last question you have to ask, is my deployment cloud or not? If no, use, use on-premise client server. If yes, use uh, cloud, cloud version of the cache. So as the last, last slide of the presentation is, uh, I propose some resources. The first one is a blog post on how to use Hazelcast as a sidecar. Second one is, is this prototype I mentioned. We did a prototype on reverse proxy sidecar caching, but it's a prototy prototype, so uh, yeah. It's, don't, don't use it in production, just play with this. Uh, the third one is not related to this presentation, but it's a very good blog post about caching in general, some best practices about caching. And the last one is a video talk about how to use Nginx as a reverse proxy caching. Uh, it's, a very, it's actually a very, very good video. So you can, uh, from this, this one video, you can learn how Nginx uh, does it. Okay, with this slide, I would like to thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Do you have any questions? About cache invalidation. Yes, how can I do it? Yeah, each each cache solution. If application is aware about caching of caching, each uh, each caching solution has has an API for invalid how to invalidate the cache. So you have like uh, if you use it together with Spring, then you have the Spring annotation. If you use like directly the caching, then each cache has uh, has some. Um, has an API for, for invalidation, that's one thing. And the second thing is you can define some strategies, uh, like, like the timeouts or like uh, what, to, what to evict if your cache is full, like for example to evict like last, uh, last used or some other strategy. But generally like, yeah, each caching provider has an API if you want to do it manually. Yes? What, what, I, I didn't get Yes. Yes, I would say it's um, it's not such a good idea. I mean, people use it for uh, for in the Hazelcast cloud. They use it, but more for a proof of concept. But I think they will. They just want to, because everybody is moving to the cloud, so they probably want to move to the cloud and they are just testing this. But usually, uh, what, for example, what, what was the demo that I connected from my laptop to the, uh, to the server in the cloud, is not good for production in general, because the, you, the latency would suffer. And we are, again, in the domain of low latency systems, so we, you don't use in-memory store to be slow. It's like that doesn't make much sense. So I would say that it, it's not a good scenario when you have an on-premise server. It's probably you would, you are better off creating an on-premise uh, cache server. Any other questions? So f thank you again.